Tell us about the benefits from an environmental standpoint uh, that have been found. Again, I guess, you know, these are second order uh, on, on some level, but it, one would not necessarily anticipate that there would be environmental benefits. Yeah, I mean, it's funny because I, I, I used to consider them second order, absolutely. And I think but in this particular moment, as COP's going on, it becomes slightly less second order to discuss right. the environmental right. benefits of a, of a policy. <laughs> so, so, I mean, we've always considered it to be, we've always been interested in the available research, particularly, for example, Juliet Shaw, based in the US. She's been, talk, The Overworked American is a great book. She's been talking about the environmental benefits of shorter working hours for decades. So... We've always paid attention to that, but I think there's been some great work um, done since, um, looking at, for example, uh, 27 OECD countries, looking at the correlations between working time and carbon emissions. There's been a strong correlation, particularly even household uh, consumption um, of carbon intensive goods. The longer, in fact, longer working hours is, is, is a stronger indicator than uh, higher wages for, for the consumption of carbon intensive goods. It's not really about how much you earn, it's about how long you work. Um, this, this is not really just about the kind of work we do, like whatever, having um, electricity on and so on, but it's really also around the consumption that, that goes with it. So things like commuting, um, a lot of people still drive, drive to work by car and so on. Um, and, and even some studies we've done on electricity use, normally weekday evening in the UK, for example, is peak electricity use. Uh, on the weekends and on bank holidays, much, great, much greater uh, reduction in electricity use kind of makes sense. You might be outside the house and so on. So, so what we're looking at here is, is, is basically um, a, quite a, a, a double win, like a, let's say, for you know, greater well-being, time away from work, but also one which can help reduce our carbon footprints in, in a range of ways. Um, and I, I think ultimately what we try to make the case in the book for is that the current debates around the climate, Green New Deal, degrowth, post-growth and so on, not always is there a kind of a question about how we transform the way we work. Often we either assume an industrial model just scaled down or we, affect, or we don't really talk about it. But I think working time reduction, a key demand of workers' movements for, for centuries, um, has, you know, really has to be there. It gives a kind of what we call a key ingredient for green movements, a bit of hope about the way that our work will be changed. A bit of, you know, Kate Soper talks about hedonism kind of green hedonism how can we you know feel like it's not just going to be austerity um uh, austerity but sustainable we want to make sure that people feel that actually you know it's, it's going to be great because we're going to have shorter working weeks and and we're going to be able to have a livable planet that's that's what we think and 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 much of that saving that you're talking about in terms of like uh you know carbon reduction would be from those sectors of 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 business that are more production oriented as opposed to service right because i mean i have four day i have a hotel i have a, a four-day work week i'm still gonna have to have people come in on that fifth day it's just gonna be different people right i mean that's basically it um yeah that's that's true but i guess what i'm yeah precisely so for example if you shut up shop and you're a um a manufacturing or construction company if you shut up shop on the fifth day that's going to be a big saving compared to a hotel which cannot do that absolutely but i think it's it's as Juliet Shaw's studies have shown it's also about the, the 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 it's it's about the consumption that comes around the workplace the, the kind of work as well. I mean, let's let's be let's be realistic. We're going to try and green these industries, try and degrade. Some industries are going to have to be scaled down and so on. But in terms of, for example, um, commuting, carbon intensive goods like you know we all know what it's like to get home from work and you order a, a delivery or you are using bottled water. All these 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 kind of these kinds of goods have been are very, very highly correlated to a very work-centered lifestyle. Um, and so, so it's, it's, it's a bit of both. It's not just about scaling down certain industries. It's also around kind of the whole carbon economy of, of how we live when we work a lot. Uh, you also make the argument that it is um, it, a shorter work week is about um, some measure of, of gender equality as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think we can boil that down into kind of two arguments, really. One is, and we emphasize this a great deal um, by delving into some kind of, to a lot of uh, fem feminist debates from the 1970s onwards, 60s onwards really, is, is, is really about the sheer amount of time that, that uh, women work versus men, and that's including the unpaid labor of the home. So things like childcare responsibilities, food preparation, cleaning, and so on, um, still falls on, on, on women to do that kind of work, even though we've seen a much greater participation in the formal labor market. So you have what's called the second shift, and so, so the first argument is to say, well, actually, if we took a, talk about the, 
the, the kind of net amount that uh, men and women work. Women work a great, uh, a, a lot more. And so work and time reduction, even in the formal economy, is of, of great of great interest to them, mainly because you also have the knock-on effect of allowing for a greater sharing of those responsibilities if both men and women are working less in the formal labor market. That's one argument, which I think is, is important to make. Um, although we must admit that the, the, the culture change around the division of labor is, is, is not just going to be solved by giving people more time, but it'll be, it'll, be, it'll be greatly enhanced. The second is that, particularly in the UK and other global north countries, uh, although actually you could probably say this about the globe, global labor market in general, um, women tend to be in jobs which are more stressful. So things like public sector work, teaching, nursing, care roles tend to be, um, uh, have greater participation by females and that kind of work is often low paid and has a huge amount of burnout and stress. So it's also in the interest of female workers to have working time reduction in general, precisely because they're in some of the most stressful roles in the, in the formal labor market. So we, we, we briefly gloss that case. We, we talk about some of the theoretical history of this uh, demand. Um, and it's, it's great to see women's groups, particularly during COVID and the kind of homeschooling debates really take up the demand for short working weeks um, as, as, as a demand really. Um, what, let's just talk briefly about, I mean, there's, there's, two, it seems to me there's two obstacles, two major obstacles to, to doing this. One is, um, sort of the, the, the political will, and I guess the, uh, desire for, uh, the capitalist class to not empower workers, uh, because it's going to cost them at one point or another. Uh, but before we get to that, let, let's just talk about some of the practical things. Like, how do you, um, how do you deal with the idea? I mean, obviously, it, it would have to be mandated on some fashion the way that our our current work week is, right? Um, how do you how do you prevent some firms from bringing in a second shift, or or, or does that matter at that point um, in terms of of you know one firm trying to be uh, more competitive than another? So I, I own a widget shop and I do four day a week and I'm able to squeeze in, you know, uh, production out of those four, four days. Um, is there, is there a scenario where other firms will, I don't know, uh, try and get out ahead or is it just going to be statutorily, I guess, um, uh, pre prevented from doing so? Yeah. I mean, I think there's, uh, you, you pick up on a really important point. It's about how, how is this either deployed? How is it enforced? Um, who are the actors involved, what's the, where's the pressure coming from. Um, we do make the point throughout the book that this needs to be taken up by the labour movement, and we're happy to see that it is in, for example, the CWU here in the UK, Forza in Ireland, um, other trade unions, for example, Ego Metal in Germany. So it's absolutely, we, we think basically without pressure from at the shop floor level and around a collective bargaining unit like a trade union, um, the shorter working week won't be able to, or the four day week won't be able to be sedimented in a way and enforced in the way that it basically needs to, as in the past when trade unions have won the shorter working week. So it's not, it's not a simply relying on the goodwill of businesses. It's not, uh, it can't simply be kind of a, um, an expectation given uh, by policymakers, given by government and allowing the private sector to, to kind of do, do it or do or not do it. It has to have that, that, that pressure. And, and that's why, you know, I think while it's important to look at the precedents and the currently existing first movers of employees who are doing it off their own back, um, I don't think we'll get there by one, one employer at a time, basically. I think it's going to have to be um, off the back of, of that kind of struggle as it has been in the past. So I think when it comes to, you know, there will be those issues for those first movers. If, they, if they're doing shorter working weeks, the competitors aren't. Um, even though there will be productivity gains, even though there will be certain advantages for recruitment and retain, ret retention and so on, um, those, those issues will potentially be there. We, we haven't seen them yet in the, in the, in the kind of um, the, the first mover companies that we're working with. But I think ultimately that's not really the strategy. I think the strategy is, is um, widespread pressure from social campaigns and trade unions and politicians recognizing this is what the kind of labor market that, they, that should be the case for all of the reasons we've mentioned, environmental and, and also kind of greater democracy and so on. That's how it's going to be implemented at a scale. Um, so, yeah, I don't think it should be um, uh, up to individual uh, competitive um, capital units.